Um, but this is our project. It's uh, the beautiful building with the, the ray of uh, light out of the sky onto it. It's that good a project. The sun shines just on it. Um, it's on a fantastic site right at the north end of the CBD. Um, and we're building a twin tower development on it. But before we get into that, I do just want to speak about something else very quickly, um, which is this building. So this building in 2015 uh, won the Institute of Structural Engineers <coughs> Award for the world's best education or healthcare building, um, which was something we were very proud of. It's the only building in Melbourne to have ever won any of the Institution of Structural Engineers Awards. Um, so if you've only come into this building via the entry down that end and into the basement, and you might have found it a little bit maybe underwhelming, I would encourage you to go upstairs and have a look around, because it's actually a really interesting um, project. Um, the brief from our client was that this building was to be a ped pedagogical device. Um, so. Being only a structural engineer, I had to look up what uh, pedagogical means, first of all. Uh, what the client meant was the building was to teach the students about architecture and construction. So when you go around the building, you'll find all of the um, services exposed, most of the structure is exposed. We've used multiple different types of structure so that the students see and learn um, about various different ways of building a building. Everything's also absolutely beautifully detailed. Um, so we're probably giving the students a completely deluded idea of what you can achieve on a normal project, but um, hopefully they, they do learn. So interesting features. Um, we are currently, we're here. Um, when you go out the door, take a look to your left, you're going to see the strangest window you've ever seen. There's a window that exposes the inside of the pile and shotcrete retaining wall. So students can be shown, this is what a pile and shotcrete retaining wall looks like. Going around the rest of the building, we have a timber roof, spans 21 meters, hangs this studio. Um, we have exposed steel bridges, we have exposed steel, uh, sorry, exposed concrete columns, slabs, walls, everything. Um, hanging bridges here, and a retained 1880s facade over here. So you can see just some examples of the kind of quality of um, exposed structure we were aiming for. The one on the left was an accident. That, that uh, staircase was never supposed to be exposed, but the architect liked it so much um, that he left it, and he insisted that he, it be left rusty and with the fabrication marks still on it. It's a real piece of, of construction. Stuff on the right is actually just behind this wall. It's in the library. And upstairs, <coughs> you can see our timber roof and our hanging studio, which is framed in steel. Um, and the timber roof is a shading device. That's why it's so, so substantial. Anyway, well worth a, a walk around. If anyone's interested, you can pretty much go where, where you like in this building. It's open to the public. OK, sorry, back to the uh, thing that you've actually come to hear about. So as I said, fantastic site. We're um, immediately adjacent to the Carlton Gardens, and which are uh, World Heritage listed. Our views can't be built out. Um, so this is an absolute premium, premium site. We've got two towers. Uh, one of them will. Um, host the first Shangri-La Hotel in Melbourne, and the first purpose-built Shangri-La Hotel in Australia, the one in Sydney is one that they bought. So this is being built to their standards. And on the left is a residential tower uh, with oh, just short of 400 apartments, I think, at this point. The site is incredibly difficult. And if there's any Melbourne structural engineers in the room, I'm sure you've probably all done some work on this site because a lot of projects have um, attempted to build on this site. It's currently occupied by a 1976 telephone exchange 
and some buildings that were intended to support a future um, telephone exchange. As it was built in 1976, it was built for housing analog technology. And within a few years, um, the requirement for space just disappeared when everything went digital. So they never built the second tower. So, so the second tower was going to be in the area that's red there. So that unfortunately has been built with foundations to take a 22-story building that we have to get out of the ground. Um, the most difficult thing about the site is that we're directly on top of the City Loop rail tunnels. Um, they were built in, started in 77, opened in 82. Um, at the same time as our building was being built adjacent. And the federal government owned the land. So the federal government muscled the Melbourne Underground Rail Loop Authority into signing an easement agreement uh, whereby, <laughs> whereby the owner of the site retained the right to build on the site, um, but only if they stuck within certain pressure limits. So 800 kPa under dead was live, um, and 1,000 kPa under transient load. Um, we don't know how they arrived at those numbers. They're a little bit random, but that's what we're stuck with. We have to comply with this 1976 easement agreement. Um, there's only one precedent building, uh, which is Castleton Place, corner of uh, Lonsdale and Spring Street, built in the in early 80s. Um, it was built over the tunnels under the terms of the same easement agreement, because this site also belonged to the federal government at the time. Um, they built 43 level uh, office tower with reasonable long span floors and they built it in steel. That was their solution to keeping this thing, keeping it light. So this is what we've got under our site. We've got four tunnels. Uh, interestingly, the tunnels were all built by different companies. So the upper two tunnels were done by tunnel boring machine. The lower two tunnels were actually excavated with a, with a road header uh, using the new Austrian tunneling method whereby they measured as they went and they anchored um, the rock ahead of them all the time. So the two tunnels, sorry, the four tunnels are actually quite different to each other, which was a, a surprise to us all. Um, thankfully, as part of the agreement that was signed, these sections of the tunnel are actually very heavily reinforced. Most of the tunnels aren't reinforced at all. They're held in permanent compression by the pressure of the rock. Um, these ones have the advantage that we have quite decent circumferential reinforcement in them. So a number of things uh, had to be done. Firstly, the decision had to be made was, do we comply with the easement agreement or do we use the advances in modeling that are available to us to prove that you can put more pressure on the ground and not damage the tunnels? Simple answer is that we've checked that and yes, you could put an awful lot more pressure on the ground and these tunnels are fine. But the legal answer that we're pursuing at the moment is we are compliant. We are going to make this building light enough that it works within the easement agreement. So we've, excuse me, so the next thing you have to do is you have to engage in a, an approvals process with VicTrack. Um, if you want to build anywhere near their assets, you have to do this. They appoint Oricon as their technical advisors. Oricon were the original designers of the tunnel and hold all the information. Um, you make a two-stage submission, so you get an, an initial quick answer, which is yes, you're on the right track, and then there's a detailed six-week um, approvals process after that. We are just on the cusp of making our uh, detailed application. So first thing we have to do to build this building on this site is make everything <coughs> as light as possible. Everything came down to the core um, and all the loads contributing to the core. So within the core, we are currently working to 120 MPA concrete. 
I'm hoping John can give us better than that. That's to, to slim the walls down as, as, as much as we can. Um, within the cores, um, all slabs and are specified as a semi-lightweight concrete, um, which still achieves 40 MPa strength, but does so at just over 2,000 kg per meter cube rather than 2,400. Um, our lift walls have to be um, concrete because there's no other way of getting a high-speed lift to work, but anything else we can make at a speed panel, we will. <coughs> and then we tender two schemes for the floor slabs. Uh, the obvious one, 120 slab on metal deck on steel. And the not so obvious one, um, which is a 165 very specific number, um, PT slab in our semi-lightweight concrete. The only thing that matters is how much load goes into the core. So it doesn't matter that we've got, a, we've got more load in our columns in this game. The columns aren't an issue. Um, all that mattered was to get as little load into the core as possible. And this scheme actually weighs exactly the same as the steel scheme. I have to credit uh, Chris, who's up the back, for developing this scheme. Um, the transient pressures um, are all governed by wind, as is always the case in this town. Uh, we've found that the, we're, we're never actually getting close to that transient pressure limit. Um, it's the dead plus live load um, limit to 800 kPa that's catching us every time. We did find some advantages from the aerodynamic shape of our buildings. Um, and we've now got our wind tunnel testing, and that's come through uh, very positive for us. Lateral stability system, central core, two levels of outriggers. And as Goman said, we had no choice where they were. They're in the plant rooms. One of the plant rooms is at 40, level 45. The other one's at level 10. Um, those aren't idealized positions at by any means, but that's what we've got. The sky bridge links the two buildings together at level 46, just above the plant room. It's just double height, so it's not like uh, the one that uh, Rob's going to talk about. Um, we spent a lot of time agonizing over whether we should tie the buildings together or not. Um, in the end, we realized that if we didn't tie them together, we simply couldn't detail the joint at the end of the sky bridge. Because we're 45 levels up, uh, we're 150 odd meters up in the air, we would have had to have detailed a joint that had a starting width of 570, could close to zero and open to almost 1200. Um, it, it's an impossible problem. Through the facade, through the floor, through the finishes, no small children falling through it. You know, it's, it was not, um, not a reasonable option. So we had to tie the buildings together. It did give us one significant advantage. Ignore the floor plate in this drawing. That's irrelevant. Um, the advantage that we got is that our two buildings are orientated such that our cores are at right angles to each other. So when we tied them together with the sky bridge, no matter what way the wind was blowing, we are always getting a stiff direction out of one of the buildings. So while previously um, one building would be, and sorry, also you'll note that the wide face, so that's one tower for example, uh, the wide face of that tower, uh, which picks up most wind, coincides with the short direction of the core. So this building would be, was moving a lot in a northwesterly wind while this building wasn't. Tying the two buildings to each other has offset that and allows that at all times, um, at least one of the cores is operating in its strong direction, which turned out to be extremely helpful. When we get down the bottom, um, we've had to do quite a bit to try and prove these pressures. So we're PTing our rafts. Um, in order to lift the center and push down the edges, which evens out the pressures. We're also looking at other options for that, but at the moment we're, we're showing PT as, as the answer to that. 
Uh, we've got basement walls that are um, installed to act like reverse outriggers, if you like. They're there to take load away from the core and spread it out on the raft. Um, all of it fighting to try and get the pressure under the center of the core down to less than 800. And we're pretty much there today, thankfully. That's what it looks like. The biggest number under there is just under 800.